Hey guys, I'm Brian. And I'm Terry. And today we got my 06 Toyota Tundra behind us and it has been having some problems. When I crank it up, we hear this noise. And that is a code for uh, 1442 is the code and it means the secondary air injection valve uh, bank two is stuck closed. Whatever that means. Yeah, it's a whole lot of details. <laughs> yeah. Well, I went to Toyota and talked to them about it and it's around a $2,000 fix. You gotta pull the manifold apart and we're perfectly capable of doing that, but I really don't feel like, nor do we have time to tear my manifold apart and then risk having something else be wrong as well. And spend $2,000. Yeah, and spend $2,000. Yeah. So we're trying to get a quick fix that will work and we found- All those pieces are inside the manifold. Yeah, they're all in there. Yeah. It's ridiculous why they did it, <clears throat> but it's what they did. Well, we found a company called Hewitt Technologies and we got this kit from them and it is a bypass kit for that. It comes with a wiring harness. If I can get it out of here, we untied it. Wiring harness that ties into the mass airflow filter. And this is a module that, the actual bypass module, yep. that overrides the uh, secondary air injection system. Is that yes. what it is? And yeah. what the secondary air injection system does is when you crank your car up, it basically diverts heat and heats up your catalytic converter really quick so that you are burning as few or no you're burning more of the garbage up and not putting extra pollution into the environment but the, we're talking yeah the, catalyt the catalytic converter is not efficient until it gets warm yeah it's burning or it's blowing debris out that would have got burned up had that catalytic converter been hot so they want to heat that thing up as fast as they can so that you don't get that little bit extra of emissions out there before it gets warm Right. And, you know, I guess one car is probably not a big deal, but when you got millions of them, yep. it adds and up. This kit is not legal in all states. So you people in California, I'm sorry, it's probably not legal there. Yeah, we don't know where it's legal and where it's not. We're not here to tell you whether or not this is legal in your area. And your state might say, okay, but your county might say no. Yeah. I don't know. So what you got to do is determine that for yourself. Yep. We're going to show you how to install it. If you install it and it's not a legal area, that's your business, not ours. But this will save you some money. Yeah. You put that on there along with this little cable here and those tell it do not come on. We also have some block off plates. We're going to loosen the junction on the back, slide these down in there, tighten it back up and this will block that off. And then we have some wire loom that will go around that purple wire to make it look nice and professional on the inside. Basically protect it from the heat of the engine. Yeah. And that needs to be routed away from the engine. We'll show you all that in just a minute. Here. Yeah or probably several minutes. Yes, it's gonna be a few minutes to install this. Generally, yeah. the installation takes a half hour to an hour and a half, depending on your skill level. It might take us a little while because We're we got filming. it set up to film all this. Yeah. So it adds a little time. Um, one thing, this is some little four inch tie wraps that we've already purchased for mm -hmm. a previous project. Do you need some way to tie off that wire loom? It doesn't have to be tie wraps. I mean, you could use tape or whatever you want to use that works, but tie wraps for us. Yep. We also needed a 10 millimeter, they say in the specs, a 10 millimeter deep well socket mm -hmm. and ratchet and or a 10 millimeter wrench. We just looked at it just to see if we could get to everything before we started. We're gonna be using this. It's gonna be a little different than what they said, but we generally don't follow the rules. No. <laughs> I mean, when it comes to mechanics, we always find a different or better way. Mm -hmm. This takes both of us to get set up there a little bit but one of the, we checked to see if we could access one of the bolts because it is in a very tight spot where these are located on the back bottom of the engine and it's hard it's, to get to it's very hard to get to i can reach it with the wrench from underneath but i have very long monkey arms so anybody shorter than six four good luck you're probably going to have a hard time reaching it with your bare hands plus when your arm's way out there you have yeah, a hard you time have a lot of torque yeah there's no torque so he wasn't able to move it yeah we run this up there yep so how's that go again? There you go. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, let's get to doing this installation. Let's do it. So the first step is locate your intake air temperature sensor slash mass airflow sensor. It's a dual purpose sensor. Uh, you need to locate that and disconnect this cable. This is a 2006 Tundra. It can vary in location, but you need to find where that uh, sensor is at. Disconnect this. You just push that little connector down and it releases it. You have to push pretty hard. I got some pretty calloused hands and that hurt my little thumb. <laughs> Next, you take the module that they give you and there's a female end that plugs into this the same way that this one was. Plug it in like that. Second, 
you take their original connector, you plug it into the other connector that's on this harness. Okay, we've got the harness connected. Next, you want to find a place to locate your module. Uh, we've seen uh, where they recommend on the back of this box here, and uh, that's part of the air intake system. That's really close to the engine. You don't want this thing getting hot. So we decided to clean up the side of the air cleaner, and we're just going to mount it right there. This is supposed to be some uh, very good 3M sticky tape here, and it's kind of a double sticky thing. We're going to mount it there, but first, we've cleaned some of this dirt off, and you have to excuse all the dirt under this car. We've been in a lot of dust lately. But I'm going to take a paper towel if I can find what I did with it. There it is. I'm going to take a paper towel and some rubbing alcohol. Put a little alcohol on the paper towel. This isn't our household alcohol. This is stuff we use around the shop. We don't want to contaminate a bottle and then take it back in the house. You can tell by the grease and stuff on it. And I'm just going to wipe this area down. And that way, get any oils or residues off of it so that the sensor will stick. Or the module will stick. Let that dry out a minute. Next, you'd want to look at where am I going to route my cable. I'm going to strap it here with a few of those tie wraps, and then I'm going to mount my module right here. All right, that's exposed. I'm going to hold this roughly where I want it so I make sure that when I do this, the cable is going to reach. I wouldn't want it stretched out and then have it hanging in the air. It's not going to be a problem here, but it's too good ha habit to get into. So now we're going to mount this on the side of here, push it down. The reason we're choosing the air cleaner area is because it's much cooler there. You do not want to mount this bypass module to the engine block or uh, heads, anything metal under there that's on the engine that's going to get really hot. It's a bad place to put it. You want to find a cool spot because heat kills electronics. Next, we need to locate the starter relay. And in this 2006 Tundra, it's going to be under this cover on the driver's side, just in front of the brake uh, system. You got relays and fuses here. And then this box, I know that it's in here, so that's where we're going. Push that button, pulls right off. There's a couple things that hook on some clips on the back side. So you pull this off and you look inside of it. I don't like the way they did this. You gotta flip it over, and now they're telling you what's what. Well, they're showing ST for the starter relay, and then they're showing some T thing that doesn't exist. So this sticker was meant for more than one truck. Kind of a defect in my opinion. But anyway, this is a module you're looking for. It's purple in here. It's a ST module, and you want to pop that out. You got to be careful when you do this. You don't want to grab just grab it and start pulling because this can pull apart, and you might destroy the relay, and then you have to go buy another one. Probably don't cost too much, but who wants to have to buy anything extra? So I'm going to use a screwdriver, and I'm going to stick it down in here. Be careful. This is electrical stuff. You don't want to just start sticking it in those holes. You might short it out. But I'm going to stick it under here and pry up and try and get that thing to start coming out of there, if I can. Ooh, well, I might have dropped that. So anyway, you probably don't want to do that. You want to hold on a little better. It, yeah, because Brian had to go into the truck and find it. Yeah, he did. Um, <clears throat> some things are in there pretty tight. They're hard to get out. But anyway, we got it out. We're good to go. Now, the next step, they want you to take this wire pull this insulation off. They've already got it pre-stripped loose a little bit, so you pull that off of there. And that is a good bit of wire. I'm going to twist it so the strands don't separate a little bit. Now, they want you to wrap this wire around this relay. And you don't want to get on the copper. You only want to get onto these uh, silver. silver or aluminum looking terminals. Give it a twisty. So it's on there good. Now I plug it back in. 
I don't want to plug it in. Okay, one thing I didn't mention is you either need a multimeter or you need a test probe, like with a light, the kind that they use for uh, automotive. You can pick one up at your automotive store. They're pretty cheap. But we have a multimeter, so we're going to use it. This is volts DC. It's going to be between 5 and 12 volts, so I'm putting it on the 20 volt range, which just means that the peak it would go to 20 volts. Um, I plugged one lead into the other end of this wire that's hooked to the relay down here. And I'm going to put the other lead. Conveniently, we have the uh, battery right here. So Brian's going to turn the engine over. And when he turns it over, we should see this jump to between 5 and 12 volts and then go to 0 volts again. If it doesn't, then we got a problem. There should be no voltage or less than one volt present. As you can see, we had 0.69 volts with the engine running, which is within the parameters since it's less than one volt. Okay, this test showed us that we made the proper wire connection. So we're gonna pull this back out. We need to make a small hole in the side of this case here and run this purple wire into here. Then we're gonna put it inside of the wire loom, run it along the firewall here and make our connection over there. So let's get that done. We tried a couple different bits and drilled a couple holes and then found which one this wire fits snugly through. It ended up being a 5 64th bit. So we're gonna drill a 5 64th bit in the back of this box, run around that firewall. When you drill your hole for the wire, make sure you blow these two tabs far enough that this does not, this little clip does not hit it. That's for the cover. It goes over there like that. All right, our next step is to get this wire in this wire loom, plug it in here, and then route it as neatly as possible over to the fuse box where the relay is located. So I'm going to start out getting this wire in here. And it's the first time I've ever done this, so we'll see how it goes. That was pretty easy. And just keep feeding it down into this wire loom. Okay, I'm gonna run this wire and we'll be back in a minute. Okay, I'm finding the easiest way to get this wire in here is grab it on the slot with your thumb here, take your other thumb, lay it on top, and just push it in there. It's dropping right in that wire loom. It's awesome. You wanna have your wire and the wire loom run out in the opposite direction of where you're standing and pulling it. That way it kinda just drops right in there, naturally. All right, we've got this wire in the harness. Now Brian and I are going to ride it around here. Grab that booger. I'd go under that thing and go over top of that hose all the way down. Okay, I got my end over here. Yeah, let's get that end plugged up first and we'll route it and we're going to tie wrap it from there back because this is the end you cut down here. Yeah. So we need, we need to get that tie wrap. Okay, I've got it plugged in. Okay, we've got our module connected to our airflow sensor and the cable's all connected properly. We've got this wire run over to the other side where the fuse box slash relay box is. So now we're going to tie this off to this cable right here just to kind of knead it up a bit. With these little tie wraps, you don't have to go too tight, just kind of hold it in place. Next, we're going to leave some slack here. This is the air cleaner and you have some clips. This cover comes off and the filter's down in here. So we're going to leave enough cable here to where it can go way out of the way if needed. We can always unplug it, but there's no sense in having to unplug it if we don't need to. This wire is just going to be laying here. It's not going to be a problem. So we're going to leave a little extra. You may have a different situation. You just have to make your situation work. All right, we've got the uh, wire loom with the wire in it run over here to the relay box slash fuse box. So I'm going to cut this wire loom off. I'm just going to use my wire cutters. Put that wire back inside there. See if I can't thread this needle. There we go. I'm going to tie wrap that right there, close by.
there we go. Now, we're going to have to strip the end of this wire again. And that wire is insulated. It'll be fine laying in that box. I'm just going to leave the excess on there. You never know what you might want to do in the future. Strip enough of this where we can wrap it around that terminal. That is their method of connecting it. It simplifies it for the average Joe and it gets the job done. So let's see if we got it right here. We're going to go with the same terminal we did last time. And I'm going to twist those wire, that wire around that booger really tight. Push it down in this hole. Get my wire pushed down here first. All right, here we go. Push it back into the block. And that should get us down the road. Take your cover. Get it oriented properly. Hook over the back tabs, push it in place. That concludes the electrical installation for the module, bypass module. Now we need to remove the nuts for the exhaust block off plates and install them and we'll be ready to run. Okay guys, this air tube has to be taken loose. There's a nut here and a nut on the other side that I can't get my finger to. It's gonna be fun to get to. I'll get this one as easy first. It's a 10 millimeter wrench or socket. I can get in here with a wrench so I'm gonna do it. Well, that one was loose. If yours is dirty or rusty or nasty, whatever, you might want to spray some uh, penetrating oil. But ours is coming loose with no problem. It's just turning right off of there. It says to take them off. I'm going to leave them on there and see what happens. We don't need that much of a gap. Now we got to get that second one. I had to get me a little step stool. See if I can reach it. Yay! All right. Am I on there? Looks like it. Okay. Of course, the second one isn't going to spin as easy as the first one because I can't get to it. All right, we're going to let Brian hit that from underneath with that long extension and that socket and see what kind of luck he has turning that thing now. I'm going to be better off with that wrench. You want to try it? Okay, we can't get the angle. And if you got long arms, it makes this real easy. Yeah, I got I got it broke loose from up here, but once there was no tension on it, it's not so hard to turn from down there. He can get to it, it's just hard to get leverage from that angle he's at. So I broke it loose and now he's taking it loose. Okay, they're saying to put a block of wood against your head. Then get a pry bar and get down here and pry this pipe. I can't even get my screwdriver in here, let alone a pry bar. Just barely. So, when I get that in there, this thing pry is really easy. I'm not damaging anything. I mean, I, there's no way I can mess up steel pulling that easily. Now, we got to get this plate on that flange. There's no way of getting it past this head. It's going to have to come from underneath. They want you to leave this little gasket against the engine, not against the pipe. So, let's try and get this up in there. There we go. I'll hold it. Brian's holding it. I'm gonna let this screwdriver out so it'll go back. And tension holds it in place. Is it in there? Yep. Okay, let's uh, maybe if you wanna give me that, you've got the wrench down there, Brian? Yeah, it's down here. Give me the wrench and you hold it up and I'll tighten this screw on this side. I'm gonna try and tighten this thing up from up here. Just a little note, this is the passenger side. I can turn that nut by hand, I think, most of the way, yeah. Now, is that plate all the way in there still? Yes. The plate's still up there. Now we're getting to the point we'll be snugging it up. Not a lot of room to work back here, but it's saving us $2,000. So, we're going to do it. You don't want to strip these out because then you'll have to try and get these studs out of here. 
That would be a nightmare. That's tight. Well, it ended up the ratchet was the way to go. Double check this other one. I think we're good. All right, let's head to the other side. Okay guys, that was the easy one. Now we got one more to go. A uh, little bit of a hassle. It's hard to get to these things and it's difficult at best to get in here with those wrenches, but just take your time and don't strip them screws out or nuts, <clears throat> the posts or the nuts. You don't want to destroy them. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, we didn't take the nuts all the way off. We loosened them up and this, this thing's like a little over, maybe around a sixteenth of an inch thick. So we had like a quarter inch of that nut turned out. I mean a quarter inch gap, plenty of room for this to slide into. So we didn't see the need to loosen it up all the way. You might want to do it. Let's get this thing done. I'm going to head back under the truck and try to work magic under there and film for you guys. Okay, let's see if we can get in here with a full size ratchet. And this side of the head's further forward, I think. There's just more room over here. Right here, correct? Yep, that's it. All right. Three eighths ratchet, deep well socket, and we're rocking and rolling. Kind of pushed it on it. Uh, oh. What well, seemed like it was going to be a hard one looks like it's going to be the easier one. You just never know. Let me see if I can turn that one by hand. It seems pretty loose, don't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Don't unscrew it all the way. I'm not. Does that look good there? can't see your hands in the way. Oh yeah, that's way more than a quarter inch. Okay, for some reason this one has been a booger. It's sticking. Try tapping on that tube. Well, the mounting plate, did it move? I think it was just froze up. Hard for me to tell from here. Yeah, it had a little bit of corrosion on it. So I think it just froze up. Uh, come on. Oh, yeah, now it's moving freely. It had just got corroded on there. And the gasket's staying where it needs to. Let's see if I can pry that out and get this plate in there. Keeping the gasket against the engine is the preferred method. Oh, yeah, it went right in. No problem whatsoever. I think we're in there. What do you think, Slim? It's good to me. All right. Let me try and tighten that thing up. Okay, guys, that is installed and ready to go. Next up would be clearing the engine codes for the check engine light. And uh, to do that, you've got to have, I think it's an OBD2 reader. You can buy them online. They would allow you to do it, uh, but they're like a hundred bucks. We really don't want to spend the money. You don't have to go that route. You can. And go if ahead. you go to the parts store, you might find someone that'll kind of look the other way and let you reset it. You have to know how to do that. They can't do it for you. No, it's, I think it's law. They cannot reset it because it's mm -hmm. supposed to be checked by a mechanic. But there is another way to do that, and that is what we're fixing to do right now. Hewitt Technologies doesn't recommend disconnecting your battery because your vehicle has learned how you drive. Yeah, and it's, it, well, it just learns how the engine runs, yeah. basically, plus how you drive. And it can run a little rough mm -hmm. for a few runs until it re recalibrates the system. Calibrates and establishes how the engine's running, how you drive, yeah. your conditions in your area. So it's computerized and it keeps sampling and saying, oh, we're running best at this rate, so mm -hmm. here's what we're going to keep doing. It's <clears> really <throat> no different than changing your battery, though. Yeah, I mean, if you have to change your battery, it's going to happen. You're disconnecting it, but doing this will reset the codes. Right, so we're going to do it. So, not recommended. That's what we're going to do. 
and we actually have someone who would let us use their uh, analyzer to reset it. There you go. We'll just screw it back down. I disconnected the negative post. All right, we're going to crank it up and see what she does. Hopefully it don't blow up. That's what I'm hoping. You're under there. Yep. Let's do it. Running like a champ. All right, guys. Well, we got it installed. Yes, we did. Finally. It's only been a year and a half to two years I've been dealing with that. It's really annoying. Yeah. If this thing malfunctioned and you're out on a highway, like we just traveled we had up go. Highway 40 through North Carolina into Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever been on that road, it's like this and there's semi trucks all around you. It says 50 and they're doing 80. Yeah. It's a death trap. If this thing broke down and we were in the left lane and there's no emergency lane where all them You're stuck concrete, and there's so much construction man. going on. It's good to get this system fixed for exactly. sure. And this is an inexpensive way to fix it. Yeah. It takes a little bit of time. It took us a couple hours to do this, but we were filming. Right. So. Oh, we've knocked it out yeah. in half of that or less. Yeah. I'd so, say somewhere between 30 minutes and an hour and a half, like they said. Yeah. Uh, Definitely helps to have a second person, some of those tight areas to reach up into and get your wrench set up for you. Really makes a big difference. If you weren't constantly saying, hold on, I got to get the camera here, I got to get. It was a nightmare. So, yeah. it, you know, it, you would have been done. We'd have oh, been yeah. done in 30 minutes. Simple and process, really. I want to say a huge thank you to Hewitt Technologies for producing yeah. this bypass kit. This thing is going to be a lifesaver. Yeah, definitely. It's going to save a lot of people a lot of money. Yeah. Again, it's up to you whether or not you do this, and you need to find out if your area allows it, and then you have to make the decision, am I going to put it in my car or not? Yep. That's up to you. If you have a Lexus, this can apply to you as well, because Toyota and Lexus are the same vehicle, just different name. It's just like Chevy and GMC, but mm -hmm. it's more of a luxury model. Right. And this will apply to your vehicle as well. This works for the Sequoias or whatever the Lexus equivalent is of a Sequoia. And this problem is on all Tundras and basically everything that has a Tundra engine because... Can be. Yeah. It, it's, uh, it will eventually rear its ugly head. So this is a simple fix if you are any at all mechanically inclined. Yeah. So hope you guys enjoyed this. I'm so glad it's done. And guys, if you can't do it, see if your wife can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can't tell you how many times the, in our contracting business yeah. we went to work on something and I'd say, well, your husband could do that. They're like... No, he cannot do that. I could do it, but he can't. But I'm going to pay you to do it. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah, and it sometimes is. it's true. That's it. All right, guys, we're going to get some lunch. It's been a long day. See you next time. Have a good one.